Welcome to Critical Role Demystified. I'm Mike Christensen, and this is the series where we break down the lessons we can learn as GMs and as players from episodes of Critical Role. Today we're tackling episode 45, Those Who Walk Away. As the game opens, the party steps through the tree and into Whitestone, and immediately they can't remember whether they camped for the night or not at the end of the last episode. This is made a little easier these days by the fact that a lot of tables use digital tools like D&D Beyond, but also I would imagine their memories about the end of the last episode are eclipsed by that one thing that happened. Kinda hard to focus on the rest of it, I would imagine. As soon as they arrive in Whitestone, Lady Kima basically says, if Allura isn't here yet, and if she isn't back in the next few hours, then Kima is going to take a team to Westron to go after her. But Vex talks her down. They can't go in loud, they need to trust Allura is being sneaky and stealthy. And Keila says they can scry on Allura and make sure she's okay. Now in the moment, this obviously feels like an excellent in-character decision. I mean, it's a terrible decision, but it's excellent because it does feel like something Kima would do. But what I didn't realize at the time is that I think there's a few plot reasons Matt was opening the door for a mission to Westron. First, Westron is relatively close to the Frostweald, which is the frozen forest where they're supposed to be able to find Osisa's mate, who has more information about other vestiges. But also, look, I don't want to say what they are yet, but once the party does eventually find their way to Westron, we'll talk about the things going on that I think Matt wanted to put directly in front of the party. But the party, wisely in my opinion, chooses to wait and use scrying to see how Allura's doing instead. Because not only is Westron probably not the party's next stop, they want to go back and visit Pyra and check on Keyless community, but also they've learned the lesson Matt was teaching them. They need to be smart about how they handle the dragons. Matt also roleplays Cash and Zara taking in Whitestone and settling in. We'll check in on them in the future, but they're not going to be a big part of every episode the party spends in Whitestone. The party goes to speak with the council and get their new magic items identified. We found two objects of power that we think may help us turn the table against the dragons. Two objects. This is good news. Oh. Two objects. What was the it was a necklace. There was? There was. You were dead. Oh, I must have missed it because I was dead. That's it's right. Dead? Well. It's been a very long day. Mostly dead. Be very careful when handling this armor, is what we're trying to say. Oh, don't handle it. So the armor is what killed you? No, no, oh, no, 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 no. The puzzle set off is what killed me. Yes, the what? Hmm. trap was a bit, it was a bit, uh, there was a trap and uh, well protected. Mm -hmm. What? What, not what, what? Yes, what? What? You didn't know that. What? So these, um, these vestiges. I really want to highlight that moment from Liam. He has obviously been thinking a lot about Vex's death, but it seems like one thing he's been factoring in is the idea that Vax missed what actually happened. Now in the last episode, Vex did ask Percy if he'd set off a trap and if that's what killed her, and he confirmed that, yes, he did. So everybody knows that, that that's what happened. Except for Vax. Because literally right before Vex and Percy talked about that, literally right before, Vax had left the room. So Liam has been keeping an eye on what his character actually knows, and so this is the first moment Vax has heard about the trap. Now I want to point out, this is hard to do. There are plenty of moments where someone on Critical Role will remark on something, and somebody else will have to point out, you're not there, or you weren't there for that. And usually, it's an honest mistake, because players don't always remember what their characters are there for. In fact, it happens later in this very episode. Anybody else in the council coming? We brought some council members, right? Were any among our well, we, we You're not there, refugees. you're with Ross. Oh, that's right, I'm sorry. Oh, I'm not there. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ross, <Hello. laughs> wanna play some bocce ball? <laughs> and honestly, with a moment as significant as the death of Vex, well, you'd be forgiven for forgetting that your character doesn't actually know the specific course of events that led to their sister's death. But Liam is working hard to keep himself honest about this, and I suspect partially that's because he knows it should kind of be a moment. Learning this is probably a big deal, and when Liam realized Vax didn't know about the trap, he knew he wanted to have that moment later on. That would be my guess. This is something D&D players don't do often enough, in my opinion. There are things that happen in our games, and as players we think, oh man, I can't wait to talk to this other character about what my character thinks about this thing they did. But it can also be even more powerful to say, I can't wait until my character finds out about this. Now, some players will then go out of their way to investigate the subject or probe the other players for more information with uh, conspicuous questions, but Liam shows us in this scene that it's actually more powerful to wait until the moment comes up organically, and then when that door is opened, you take the opportunity to step through it. That is a remarkable amount of patience. Like, speaking personally, I know I would feel tempted to immediately find some justification to ask about it. Like, 
How exactly did Vex die? What happened? How can we make sure it doesn't happen again? Now, that's not an outrageous question to ask. And if the trap hadn't been mentioned so early in this episode, then I suspect Liam would have found the time to ask it later. In fact, Vex has a similar moment later in the episode regarding her resurrection. She goes and asks about it. Given the events in question, it's not unreasonable for these characters to ask some follow-up questions. But here's the thing. The reason this moment happens the way it does is because Liam is just being a really good listener. He hasn't said much at all in this session so far. Vax has been in his feelings about Vex's death. But I know I could sometimes do a better job of being an active listener, the way Liam was in this scene. It's such a minor moment, but it genuinely impresses me so much. Anyway, back to the scene. Keeper Yenin identifies the armor, the Deathwalker's ward. Uh, it's obviously a powerful magic item, it's a vestige, but specifically it grants advantage on death saving throws, and it offers resistance to one damage type of your choice from the list of fire, cold, lightning, acid, or necrotic, with the option to change that resistance on a short rest. They give it to Vex for the time being. Yenin also identifies the black crystal, and there's a creature inside the gem. He identifies the crystal as the Raven's Slumber, it's a gateway to a pocket plane. You can contain a creature. Uh, it can't be too big, and if the creature isn't willing, they have to make a saving throw to resist getting pulled in. So with a trap, we could also trap other creatures. Is he like, it's like a Pokeball, right? It's like a, it's like a Pokemon? But who knows he'll, he'll yes, go it's exactly back. like a Pokeball. Who knows he'll go back <laughs> in willingly? You don't have to go in willingly. I guess you can kind of technically use it yeah. that way. Yeah. <laughs> that moment from Matt is just like the realest shit. Vex checks her book to see what kind of enemies Pervon might have faced that could have be in the locket, and Matt points out that Pervon had an ally named Galdrick, so that might be who's in the locket. What if he's friend? I mean, he talks about being an ally. It might be an ally. Well, then wouldn't we want to see An save ally it? of Pervon. An ally of Pervon's. Yes. Is Pervon no. a good guy? Yes. He's... I thought the Raven Queen was not good. No, the Raven Queen... She's kind of like can neutral. I, can I can I can I make a roll for this? Make a religion check. Okay, thank you. I'm being, oh no, it's St. Patty's Day. <laughs> <laughs> I want to highlight that moment as well. See, Talison knows what's up with the Raven Queen. He's been playing D&D &D with Matt for years. He knows the Raven Queen isn't evil. At least that's what it seems like. But I really appreciate him taking a minute to justify that knowledge by actually asking for a roll. Anyway, since they don't know what's in the locket, if it's a friend or a foe, they decide to release it somewhere safe. That way, if it's hostile, they can fight it, and if it's friendly, then maybe they can have an ally with them in the locket. They plan to release it in the Stone Giant Caves a few hours from Whitestone. That way, they're not too close to Whitestone, and they can keep the city safe from whatever they might release. Now, they do remember that they camped before the tomb. This is when they figure that out. So they need to rest. So they just plan to take care of some stuff tonight and then open the locket in the morning. And the first thing that happens is... Percy takes Vax aside for a private moment. Full time goes on the screen, it's a great interaction, it's less than five minutes long, but I want to hit some of the highlights. Percy apologizes, and while he waffles a bit and offers a lot of thankfully it wasn't worse and everybody makes mistakes, I want to jump ahead to the heart of the matter. I rushed in and triggered the trap that almost killed your sister. That killed my sister? I felt the danger had passed and I moved too quickly and opened the casket without thinking. Sometimes we just move too quickly. In the future, um, if there is anything that your little heart desires inside of a box, uh, in the future, could you check with my sister or myself first? That's the hope. Well, listen, Percy, uh, we are not playing a game, no. and we will all make mistakes, and I wager I will make my fair share. I've little doubt. And Percival, I want to apologize. I'm sorry, but, um, and I punch him in his know-it-all <gasps> fucking mouth. <laughs> Good night, Percival. Good night, Vax. It's four in the afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> now here's a lesson. Liam has discussed this scene since, but in the moment, as he struck Percy, Liam had the thought, wait a minute, who am I to talk? Vax has rushed off multiple times and nearly gotten himself killed. It happened twice in the Briarwood arc alone. He knows that these kinds of moments can happen. So again, after this punch, in the moment, Liam made a conscious choice as Vax to not pursue this any further. He punched Percy, but now it's time to move on. As far as he's concerned, yes, it's realistic for Vax to have an emotional response, but there's also a limit to what is reasonable, given his own past behavior. So he chooses to leave it here. 
because it's what my character would do can only go so far. And you actually have to play your character responsibly. Now, I wouldn't have thought twice about this moment. I think that punch is pretty reasonable, all things being equal. But now that we know Liam was tempted to linger in this moment and chose to temper his response and leave the animosity towards Percy behind, leave it settled with this scene, well, I've got mad respect for Liam for making that choice. Keyleth and Vex meet up with Kima in the bar, and Keyleth casts scrying on Allura. Matt describes Allura and Drake Thunderbrand pilfering a book from the ruins of the Cobalt Reserve, and then turning it to sparks and zipping away from Westrim. Also, Matt narrates that they hear heavy thumping on the floor above them, like heavy footsteps. More on that in a future session, but that's some foreshadowing for what's going on in Westrim. But also, Matt offers some more concrete exposition that the party can get their heads around. As Allura and Drake zip away, Keyleth sees the Black Dragon fly past, flying toward Gatshadow, the tall mountain very close to Westrin. The cast correctly concludes what Matt is implying. The Black Dragon has taken up residence in Gatshadow, and is effectively ruling over Westrin. They also finally realize Kima doesn't actually know that the dragon that attacked him on is Thordak, the dragon she and Allura fought years ago, the dragon who killed a bunch of their friends. So Kima leaves to go get some air, and this is where Vex finally asks Keyleth what exactly happened during her resurrection. Keyleth has a really hard time articulating it, not just because it was so traumatizing, but because there's still a lot of question marks. Eventually she tells Vex that Vax offered his life for hers, but obviously nobody knows exactly what happened after that, or whether the Raven Queen took him up on the offer. Vex leaves, and Keyleth sits alone, crying. Meanwhile, Scanlan and Grog are just sort of... Hanging out. Grog has to poop, so Scanlan offers to stand outside the outhouse and play some music to mask the sounds. And so, masked by the music, Grog takes out Craven Edge and has a conversation with his blood-drinking sword. So, my question is, as much as I love opening up people to feed you, I kind of want to know, like, what's in it for you? <laughs> Grog, are you talking to your shit? Yeah, no, you gotta let it know who's boss. <laughs> voice creeps in again this time. There is no feeling more terrifying than hunger, and I hunger forever. You help satiate that hunger. That is our arrangement. I give you the strength of those you cut down, and I feed upon them. If this is unsatisfactory, I can and have found others who are more willing to be part of no, this arrangement. No, 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 I'm a big fan, really. I mean, I'm yoked out when I'm using you. It's fucking amazing. Good. I mean, people are flying apart. It's like a dream. But listen, <laughs> can you ever be full? I've never been full before. Perhaps you're the one to find out. I bet I am, actually. You're really lucky you found me. A lot of these other blokes not even half the man I am. <laughs> My hunger grows, but the air tarnishes my blade. Perhaps we can continue this conversation elsewhere. <laughs> right, yeah, no, probably improper. Well, look, I like, I like the way you, you cut people open, so we'll continue this another time. And I, I'll sheave him. All right. As you oh. sheave, the last thing it says is, don't forget, I hunger. Now listen, Grog knows this sword is spooky, Travis knows this sword is spooky, Earthbaker Groon basically scolded Grog for using this sword, so Grog knows there's at least some sort of stigma around Craven Edge, but he doesn't think to actually go and identify it. Instead, he just asks Craven Edge. And I don't have a ton to say about this other that I haven't said about the other role-playing scenes in this episode. The scene is just a delight. A Percy does some tinkering, makes some bullets, and a siege arrow. Scanlan visits Jameson the painter, and Matt gives a glorious description of Scanlan's huge portrait. Again, I, I don't have a ton to say here, but I do recommend you watch just so you can see Matt flex his narration muscles. But again, this is a great way to reward Scanlan for taking the time, several episodes ago, to commission this painting. Just give him a description of how amazing it turned out. We are barely an hour into this episode, and it's been almost entirely one-on-one -on -one role-playing scenes, all of which are bangers. And it's time for one more. Vax goes to see Keyleth, and we get yet another lovely role-playing scene. Because as the party is dealing with all these consequences of the previous episode, there's one big question that still needs to be answered. I don't know magic. I don't know anything. I open doors, and only when the wind is blowing in the right direction, sometimes I think, I don't know what happened. But I felt her. Do you still feel her? 
Make a perception check, Max. Twenty-two. As you're sitting there, kind of looking down at the ground, as she asks this question, you notice the uh, symbol of Serenray that you have stitched into the back of your glove. What was once a very vibrant, kind of goldish brass color, has actually very heavily tarnished, and the metal itself seems to have cracked in three places. It was not this way a day before. Yeah. I can attempt a restoration, a greater restoration spell, and see if I can sense anything. The spell completes. You sense no difference in your current physicality, mindset, and there's this pause, this silence of no realization that is suddenly shattered by the sound of a you look over and at the stone edge of the window you guys are staying and you see stepping there a single dark raven. <laughs> and it just takes off and flies into the night. I think this goes beyond any natural realm that I have any bearing over. So obviously Matt is telling the players that yes, something huge and supernatural happened. And I like the way this is handled separately from spells or other effects. It feels more subtle, more like soft magic. They don't see the raven arrive, they don't see the symbol of Saren Ray break. And that's a really cool, interesting way to handle the direct influence of the gods. It's not always as flashy or direct as the magic cast by mortals. Honestly, this is one of my favorite things about this episode and about Vax's new story arc. The influence of the Raven Queen, this phenomenal cosmic being, is being handled with a lot of subtlety. Vax tells Keyleth that he loves her, and she says she thinks she loves him, but she's afraid to let herself. Even if they survive the Chroma Conclave arc, once she completes her Aramente, she'll be practically immortal. Keyleth is just describing the uh, narrative justification for the druid's 18th level ability to almost stop completely aging. So someday, she'll watch them all die. And that means she's afraid to let herself love Vax fully and deeply. And Vax's response to this is to flee the room immediately. And for the second time today, Keyleth bursts into tears. <laughs> oh, why do people be leaving me <laughs> and roll the rooms alone? The next morning, Vax finally embraces Vex and starts getting back to his old self at least a little bit. Vex gives Vax the Deathwalker's Ward armor, although he really doesn't want it. That's something else Liam has discussed. Uh, he said that they had a meeting around this time and Liam was in a bad place because of personal stuff. We talked about that in the last episode but he was really not excited to go into this Raven Queen subplot and wear this armor. Not just because of the plot line itself, I don't think, but just because of everything he was going through. But in the moment, he does reluctantly accept the armor, although he does not put it on yet. So the party heads off to the stone giant fortress to open up the Pokeball. I don't know how to use this thing. Yeah, we no, don't come know on. how to use it. Sure do. You're our magic By user. the power of Raven's slumber, I command thee. <laughs> Awaken, beast, cruel or otherwise. <laughs> Face your new master and know his name is Scanlan! <laughs> <laughs> Holy shit! Never could have been better. <laughs> and out from the locket bursts forth a wolf. This is Galdric, the companion of Pervon. Keyleth casts speak with animals and conveys that Pervon has died long ago. They try to bond Galdric with Vax since he's hastily putting on Pervon's armor now and seems to have some sort of connection with the Raven Queen, they think but Galdric ignores him and starts to leave. Grog intimidates Galdric to heal and respect them, and they give him a new job, to defend Whitestone. Galdric. <clears throat> Only a beast of your great fortitude. Just fucking tell him to do it. Right, okay, <laughs> sorry. <clears throat> Would you like to guard the command? The town, command it. Whitestone. C guard this, to this town. Dog. Keyleth, repeat after me. Yes. How long? In exchange for food, protect these lands. <clears throat> Galdrick. In exchange for food, shelter, and a cozy fire. I didn't say that shit. I didn't say that. <laughs> He's a wolf. He doesn't need those. <laughs> Patrol these lands. Protect these lands. Protect these lands. <laughs> 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 For how long? <laughs> I know, but he's, you want details. Why does the dog want? As long as as we need you no, to. No, no. A great danger approaches. Until the danger has passed. You'll know it when it comes. <clears throat> a great 
danger. Approaches! Um, approaches! Approaches! A great danger approaches. Your service is required until that danger has passed. Has passed. Has passed. Is no longer in effect. You'll know when it comes. You'll know. You'll, know. Comes. You'll know. Then am I free to go? Then you are free to go. Very well. I grow tired of service. I wait too long. And the wolf just looks at you, gives you kind of like an acknowledgement, and then walks off into the woods. Bye, buddy. Thanks, Goldrick. Appreciate it, man. <clears throat> man, that's a cool looking wolf. How you looking, Grog? How's that? Does that sound okay? That was the dumbest thing I've ever heard. <laughs> <laughs> Marisha is very, very good at playing somebody with terrible charisma. At this point, the party realizes that they can use the stone to carry Trinket with them and keep him safe. They go over their to-do list and decide that their next stop is definitely the Fire Ashari. They divide up some unclaimed magic items and decide to take the day to try to craft some potions of fire resistance and wait one more day for Allura because they would love to bring her. Mainly because they have no idea how to close the rift into the fire plane, but she might know. Brog takes Percy aside and asks to be pointed in the right direction for some houses of ill repute. Percy doesn't know where they would be and doesn't think that they're back in use again anyway, so when Grog asks Percy not to say anything about it yet, Percy delivers one of his most devastating one-liners. No. Oh, okay. I'll, I'll let Scanlan know. Just keep it between you and me, because he's very sensitive about these things. I... I... You, secret is safe with my indifference. Oh. That's fine. <laughs> As I said, Keyleth wants to make potions of fire resistance, but she also wants to cast Hero's Feast on the party, since that's becoming one of their pre-combat rituals. But she also has to be the one to cast Transport via plants, and since both those spells are 6th level and making a potion takes a long time, there's a lot of confused back and forth about the order of events. They eventually clarify that in order to do what they want to do, Percy and Keyleth need to spend all night making potions, then she'll cast Hero's Feast for breakfast, and then she and Percy will take their long rest during the day, and then she'll use transport via plants in the evening to take them back to the fire Ashari. As the party waits for Keyleth and Percy to wake up, we do get one more terrific little role-playing scene between Vax and Scanlan. How do you do it? How do I do what? How do you do it? You're risking your life as much as anyone in this group. You're almost dying every day. You're fucking smiling all the time. The two How did you do it? I'm kind of asking his lean to Sam as well, but mostly, <laughs> is Vax a skeleton? How do you do it? I don't know. I mean, I just, I like you people, okay? Everything before this was not as good. This is better. That's why. It's very simple. You had a shitty childhood, didn't you? Yeah. You and, you and the sister. Yeah. I think Grog had some, some troubles. We've all had our share of shit before we all met. Now we're together, we're a family. This is better. That's how I smile. It's better than it was before. That's it. We're probably going to die in the next month. Yes, but it's fun while it lasts. <laughs> Listen, I'm older than you. How much older? A bit. I've seen more than you have. And it's all shitty. So it just depends on how you look at it. You can dwell on the shit, or you can just leave it behind in people's beds and keep going. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, that works on you. too deep. Oh levels. God, it's too deep. We're too deep. <laughs> you did. Water under the bridge. Proper stick is coming. I walk away. Little <laughs> <laughs> motherfucker shit in my bed. <laughs> Here's why I love this scene. First, it actually gives us some legitimate insight into how we can look at someone as cartoonish as Scanlan and imagine them as an actual character. It's not lost on me that some folks have a really hard time connecting with Scanlan for a lot of this campaign, but this scene helps me reconcile his goofiness and figure out how a person could that maybe legitimately act the way he does. Second, this scene will wind up being referenced and remixed and have a big impact during the course of the game. And third, that metaphor is just too perfect for the puckish Lothario who also poops in people's beds. Like... I don't like the bed pooping behavior, I could take or leave the womanizing, but if you've got a character who does both, then this speech is just so perfect. In the evening, they cross through the tree and arrive at Pyra, and they see lava flowing across the mountain pathway and Ashari members trying to cool and clear the lava. The party approaches and discovers that some of the Ashari aren't just fire Ashari, 
there are visiting members of the Arashari here from Keyless Homeland to uh, help deal with this disaster. The Fire Ashari leader, Sir Konos, is now missing an arm. He says the Fire Ashari basically reaped what they sowed by helping the Outsiders trap Thordak in the fire plane. But he's also very grateful to Vox Machina for coming to help them. Don't don't mistake what he's implying here. He he they, they went through a disaster and he appreciates the help. Also, guess who else is here? It's Keyless' father, Corin. They also see the rift to the fire plane unleashed and pulsing with power. But that's where they're going to pick up next time. Thank you so much for watching. We'll be back with the next installment in two weeks to discuss episode 46, Cinder Grove Revisited. Pretty much the whole episode is dedicated to the adventure in Pyra, and they also have a guest star, Chris Hardwick. I'm aware Chris Hardwick had a credible Me Too allegation in 2018, so I won't begrudge anybody who skips that episode. This is going to be my first time going back to it, and additionally, even setting aside the context around his uh, alleged behavior, I remember this guest star very much playing a joke character in the midst of what is ultimately a very serious moment in Keyleth's story arc, so... I'm going to be very curious to break down that episode and see what lessons we can learn from it. But come back here in two weeks to watch me try, I suppose. In the meantime, I make other videos as well, so be sure to subscribe and ring that bell. I post my videos early on Patreon, and I plan to resume other Patreon rewards next year, so check that out if that seems like it might be your thing. I join my Discord server to hang out with other cool people, and sign up for my newsletter, and all those links are in the doobly-doo below. Uh, in this episode, Percy said that he just wasn't thinking when he opened the sarcophagus and got Vex killed, but... I think part of the issue was just that there was a lot going on. In fact, I broke down the entire core problem behind that scene in a separate video. You can check that out right here. Until next time, play fair and have fun.